Hello. Human beings have a rational and also a deeply spiritual, intuitive, mystical side to them as well. I suppose it's the animal in us. Um, some, have it, some have it more than others. This next story is about a, a man who considers himself to be a rather bright, rational person and his girlfriend, who is quite the opposite. And there the twain shall meet. Don't walk under the ladder, James, Jill told her boyfriend, tugging him into the road to avoid him doing so. Jim laughed. I suppose it would be better to get knocked over by a car, he said. Don't laugh about such things, she said reproachfully. Why not? It's silly. It's bad luck, she said. It's bad luck to get knocked over by a car because you're trying to avoid the bad luck you get by walking under a ladder, he retorted humorously. You see, this is the problem with you, James. You make a joke of everything. Things that are serious, Jill said, a note of weary exasperation in her voice. She was visibly annoyed. You lack an aura of empathy, she added for good measure. A subtle slap across the face. A what? An empathy with the inexplicable. I can't explain it. You either understand it or you don't. It's like trying to explain music to a tone-deaf person. Hmph, <laughs> James expostulated, still retaining his good humour. I just have no patience with mumbo-jumbo, that's all, he said. Anyway, I don't want another argument, said Jill. Jim was annoyed now. It was a familiar way for her to close off an argument between them, yet still feel she had come out on top. It was enough to break his composure. Oh, good God, he exclaimed, do you want me to believe in Father Christmas and the Easter Bunny too? How about fairies? You're pathetic, you really are. You're a spiritual illiterate, said Jill. Anyway, I have to be off home now. I've got Jane coming over for tea. Oh, be sure to read the tea leaves he called to her by way of a parting shot. I'll see you tomorrow, and I hope you're in a better mood, she retorted. Jill marched off, a haughty briskness in her step, leaving Jim staring after her, standing there with his hands furious upon his hips. He had been in a fine mood, actually, and her denial of this was simply calculated to put an end to it. The conversation had gone the way many of their conversations went these days, and once again, he felt vaguely as though he had been bested by her, in spite of the fact that he should have won. It was a knack she had of getting the better of him. Unfortunately, this was not the first row the couple had had on the matter of things in the mystical realm, nor was it likely to be the last. Jim was quite aware of that. He had always been aware of her predilection for goofy beliefs and superstitions, but had taken it with lofty, amused toleration, and a pinch of salt at first, in the early days when they first started going out together. But it had become a niggle, then had developed into a little contest between them, which inevitably ran its familiar course, and ended with her leaving him standing there with some low-key insult ringing in his ears. The whole business was out of hand in his view. What had been an irritation at first, had become a stone in his shoe, and now the whole business had become so acute between them that as soon as anything of the mystical was mentioned by her, the conversation followed a predictable pattern of ever-decreasing circles and resulted in a breach between the couple. Jim's casual refusal to take her astrological predilections seriously had become absolute. Now he greeted any mention of stars, their alignment or otherwise, with an inward roll of his eyes and a deep groan, and it was an ongoing source of profound disharmony between them. The time he had opened an umbrella in the house to let it dry out was a matter they still quarrelled over, and the time she had given him a blue glass pendant to ward off the evil eye and discovered it subsequently crushed under his boot in the footwell of his car had nearly led to a permanent schism between them. From Jim's point of view, he believed that he had to be firm with her over her addiction, because that's what it was, an unhealthy obsession with the superstitious. And hadn't he right on his side? 
After all, this wasn't the 14th century. She needed curing of it. It was soon after this latest incident between the couple that Jim had bumped into an old school friend, Fred Gimp, whom he hadn't seen for some years, and the two young men stood in the busy Saturday street catching up. Fred told him he lived in Australia now and was home for a couple of weeks to attend his brother's wedding. The two were standing outside the Rosen Crown, and it being lunchtime, James suggested they step inside for a drink. In the course of their conversation, he told Fred about Jill and their ongoing fractious relationship over a pint of lager. Perhaps you just aren't in sync, suited to each other, Fred Gimp suggested. James shook his head. It isn't that exactly. We get on fine when we aren't talking about all this astrological stuff, he said. It's when she gets a bee in her bonnet or starts dragging me from under a ladder or having a nervous breakdown because I have broken a mirror. You wouldn't believe some of the stuff. Look out, there's a black cat. Here Jim gave a shrill imitation of his beloved and broke off into a peal of laughter. As this swore off, he shook his head, the amusement draining from him. Fred Gimp sympathized, but said, Couldn't you just go along with it? You know, I mean, to keep the peace. Jim sighed heavily. It's nuts, he said. She needs to learn what a fraud it all is. Yes, but if she won't, and you want the relationship to work, one of you is going to have to compromise a bit. Yes, you're right, said Jim sorrowfully. But she won't do it, see? There's no compromise in her. If she just keep quiet about... Well, actually, what I meant was, you might tolerate her superstitions a little. What? You mean start accepting her gobbledygook? Start reading my horoscope each day? Oh, Venus is in alignment with Mercury. Business opportunities will prove fruitful. I tell you what, I don't think so, my friend. No, I mean just a little give and take in the matter. You know, not kick off when she mentions something you don't agree with. It wouldn't hurt. Jim stared at his friend long and hard, as if the latter wasn't all there. Perhaps he'd been down under for too long. God knows what went on in Australia. But all that time they spent upside down couldn't be good for their brains. No, that's not it at all, he said at last. She needs curing, like it's an illness. Fred sighed. I still think a little accommodation on both sides would be best for you. Both of you, he said. It really wouldn't be so bad to roll with the punches a little. Pretend to believe some of the things. You'll be suggesting I carry a rabbit's foot around next, said Jim scathingly. The two men sipped at their pints. Then suddenly an alert gleam of inspiration came into Jim's eyes. He placed his glass down with decision. You know, he said with suppressed excitement, you might have something there. That's more like it his friend said encouragingly. I told you, give and take. No, no, Jim swept aside his friend's notions impatiently. Pretend, he said, with emphasis, pretend to believe. That's the key. Well, that's what I said, began Fred, but Jim had raised his hand to forestall him, was already shaking his head in anticipation of his friend's misunderstanding. He was way ahead of him. He was ahead of most people. No, what I mean is, if I could get someone to parlay a load of stuff about the stars, or predicting the future or something, and she believed them, well, there'd be all sorts of possibilities, you see? No, like what? said the slow Fred Gimp. Like how great I am, for instance, how intelligent, how handsome, and how perfect I am for her, and how she should listen to me more. Fred looked at Jim dubiously. It would be a hard sell, that, he said, shaking his head. Oh, come on, she believe almost anything if she thinks the person telling her has some sort of powers. It's not easy to do, Fred assured him. My sister bought a crystal ball and did a turn at some fairs and fates a couple of summers back. People expect a lot if they're going to cross your palm with silver. Jim stared at Fred. A crystal ball, you say? Nice. Has she still got it? I don't know, 
I expect so. Why? Because I have a job for you that's right up your street, said Jim. Oh, no, said Fred, catching on. No, no, no. I'm not getting involved in anything like that. This is a matter between you and the missus. Oh, come on. It would be a hell of a good laugh we'd have at her expense. Think of the fun we could have. I see a tall, dark man with one blue eye and one green eye, terribly handsome, a becoming manly scar on his chin, and you must obey him, for he is wise beyond his years. You see what I'm thinking? She'd see right through it, unless she's very thick, said Fred. Is she? No, not thick, just gullible, easily taken in by frauds and charlatans. She needs curing of it. Well, I don't like it, said Fred. It's a mean thing to do, and it really isn't my sort of thing. How about a hundred quid for the gig? said Jim coaxingly. Fred looked at him seriously. Frankly, it seems a bit unfair on your girlfriend. Two hundred quid, eh? he said. A hundred is what I said. We'd be doing her a favour too, said Jim. Yeah, let me get you a refill there. He took up his friend's empty pint glass and his own, and insinuated his way to the lunchtime bar before Fred could object. He returned with two cold pints, brimming to a froth trailing down the sides of the glasses minutes later. Cheers, he said. Cheers. Fred was thoughtful. Well, asked Jim, in a conspiratorial way, what do you think? Not a lot, to be honest, said Fred. I could use a couple of hundred quid. A hundred, and you'd be doing us both a tremendous favour, you know. Fred looked at him, still reluctant. I'd like to do you both a favour. And two hundred quid, you say? Jim sighed. Okay, two hundred pounds it is, then. It would be one time only. Absolutely, Jim assured him. You tell her what she needs to hear. I pretend to gobble it all up, too. Reluctantly at first, I'm not going to swallow it all straight off. Even Jill wouldn't buy such a sudden conversion. I have to come round slowly, you see. Yes, I see, said Fred, beginning to catch up with his friend's far quicker mind. He nodded. I keep coming up with things that no one could possibly know about you. And your girlfriend, things you've told me. And gradually you become more and more astonished. That's it. That's it exactly, exclaimed Jim. Eventually you will overcome all my doubts and objections, and she'll be pleased as punch. And then, inquired Fred, then you tell her to behave herself, sort of thing. Tell her to listen to me, and we all live happily ever after. Hmm. Well, I could definitely use that two hundred pounds, said Fred. It was a couple of days afterwards when Jim next saw Jill. They went to the cinema, and on the way home he told her of this old friend of his, Fred, and happened to mention in passing that Fred claimed to have supernatural powers and saw things in a glass orb of some kind. Can you imagine? he scoffed. I always thought he was okay. Seems he's gone loony since I knew him at school. Probably the sun in Australia has affected his brains. Nice to see you have your open-minded approach to things you don't understand, she commented. Oh, come on, it's all rotten, you know it. He can no more see the future than I can. It was a familiar challenge, and the outcome promised to be familiar also, except this time Jim had this well planned. She turned to him. How do you know, she demanded, how do you know he can't? Just because you can't see further than the end of your nose, it has to mean no one else can, right? More or less, he said steadily. We're all the same, except maybe I'm a bit brighter than the average bear. No, we're not all the same. Some people have an aura. They can intuit things that others can't. They can contact spirits and see the future. They sense things others can't. Like animals know when there's going to be an earthquake. Just because you don't have that gift doesn't mean no one else can have it. Pretty much does, I think, said Jim, considering the argument. The only thing they see coming is a fool and their money. Pig-headed, that's what you are. If you just opened up your mind the slightest bit, it would be a wonder. Really, said Jim, you think I can't be open-minded? No, 
she said emphatically. It's impossible for you. Well, you're wrong, said Jim. I don't think so. She sat with her arms folded in defiance. Now who is being closed-minded, he accused her. Don't try to turn this round on me, she said. Prove just for once you can be open-minded that there may be people with such powers, powers you not only don't have, but can't even conceive that others might have. It was a challenge. You don't think I can, he demanded. No. Okay, I'm going to go and see my friend and ask him a few things. We'll see if he can answer them. I bet he can't. Going into it with the right frame of mind, I see, she said sarcastically. No, I'll tell you what he says, Jim averred. No, no, that won't do. You'd tell me anything, she laughed. I wouldn't. I'd tell you the God's honest truth, he retorted. No, sorry, she said. You must think I'm soft. Well, what do you propose, then? he demanded, hands on his hips. We'll both go. I'm not taking your word for it. Really? You think it will make the slightest difference? Yes, I do, she said defiantly. All right, then, he said, stung to the quick. You come too, for all I care. We'll see what he has to say. All right, then. It'll be a lesson for you. Oh, we'll see. Yes, we will. It was settled. Jim was rather pleased with himself at the way he had contrived the matter. It showed just how gullible Jill could be, not to spot a set-up even. Mind you, he had shown some skill in the way he had done this, so he could forgive her for not tumbling to the gag immediately. He informed Fred with much amusement of the arrangement the next day, and they arranged for him to come to Jill's house on Saturday afternoon. Fred was doubtful still. I don't like it, he said. It's kind of deceitful, tricking your girlfriend like this. It's good for her, though she won't know it yet, Jim informed him. She'll thank me later. Well, said Fred doubtfully, I'm not sure. But I am, see, said Jim. And two hundred quid for you, too, he reminded him. On Saturday, Fred arrived dressed for the part. He was dark-suited and mournful in appearance, a man used to seeing far too much tragedy in the future, a man who communed with the spirits, the souls of the departed, which hovered restless, ever near us, unseen. He greeted Jim solemnly, who returned the greetings easily, betraying scepticism and levity in every movement. Jill was much more welcoming, and smiled enthusiastically at her fellow believer, a communer with spirits, a seer of things unseen by others, one who could move beyond the mortal plane of the present, and venture into the future with all its perils. "'Wait, don't tell me,' said Fred, when introduced to Jill. "'I sense a great aura in you. You have recently come from a great distance.' Why, yes, she said in surprise, I have. Oh, come on, said Jim. No, wait, said Fred, clutching his head. From the Midlands, Birmingham, no, Worcester. I've just been on a visit to my aunt in Worcester, exclaimed Jill, wrapped in wonder, and turned to Jim for corroboration. Ha, 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 said Jim in amusement. I told you that. Nope, said Fred firmly, you did not. See, said Jill, triumphant. Oh, I must have mentioned it and forgotten about it. It's nothing, said Jim dismissively. Fred ignored this slight, and so did Jill. Fred produced his glass orb like a great seeing stone of import. He held it with the care its station demanded, wrapped in a dark blue velvet cloth. It held the future. He carefully unwrapped this with great care to reveal the shining orb with a solemnity which very nearly caused Jim to laugh uproariously. He had to admit it. Fred's performance was really quite excellent. "'Shall I get us a cup of tea before we begin?' Jill said, her eyes shining with excitement. "'That would help to settle my mind,' said Fred gravely. 
I am always nervous when I engage with the spirits. It is an exhausting process. I can imagine, said Jill, breathless in awe. He can read our tea leaves, quipped Jim. Jill glared at him and left for the kitchen. Hook, line and sinker, exclaimed Jim in a hoarse whisper of delight as soon as Jill had left the room. Ooh, I can imagine, he said in a high voice, emulating his nearest and dearest. Listen, whispered Fred urgently, I don't like this. She seems so nice, so trusting. Jim winked. We're doing her some good, believe me, and you're helping an old pal too, he assured his friend. Mostly you, said Fred doubtfully. You're getting two hundred pounds out of me for this, my friend, he reminded him. Okay, okay. Just keep to the script, said Jim, jabbing his finger at the glass orb in which were instilled the secrets of the unknown. The reading began inauspiciously enough, yet Jill waited upon every pronouncement Fred made with awe. I see many things that have been and the things that are as yet obscured in the glass, the future is becoming in the lens. Jill's lips were parted slightly, as one who is in the presence of the majesty of the unknown. There is a man, he continued. Jim chortled a little, receiving a sharp elbow in the ribs for this transgression. He put his hand to his forehead, a wry smile about his lips his tongue firmly in his cheek with amused surprise. Jill darted a furious warning glance at him. He is troubled with disbelief, continued Fred. He fights against what he does not comprehend. That's you, whispered Jill severely. Oh, chances are, said Jim lightly. He sat, arms folded, a sour grin of permanent disbelief etched upon his face, he does not know the things that lie before him in the future, intoned Fred mournfully. That's true, said Jim, scoffingly. Can't fault you there. But he will come to know them. His future is uncertain. Why am I not surprised, commented Jim, to any spirits who might be loafing around the room. Fred ignored him, seemed not to hear him, and continued. There is conflict in his life. Conflict at home and in his work, both will be resolved. There has to be more than this, exclaimed Jim out of the corner of his mouth to Jill. This is ridiculous. Shh, she urged him. It's true. You were only saying about work the other day, remember? Hmm, commented Jim. His situation in work will resolve in his favour, said Fred peering into the glass orb with great intensity of concentration, his hands trembling slightly, hovering above the glass, as if to contact the spirits captive therein. It will? asked Jim, in spite of himself. How? It isn't clear. Wait. A vacancy occurs in his place of work, and as a result there is a promotion. Well said Jim, with a grudging note of acquiescence. I am well thought of in work, and tipped for site manager position. Jill nodded in curt approval. Told you, she said. His course in his career will be swift and profitable, continued the messiah of the orbaculum. It does seem probable, conceded Jim, part convinced. An unexpected opening in another department will open the way for his talents. I see a death leading the way to this. That'll be Ted Broughton. He's got a dodgy ticker, Jim said with wide eyes. I knew it. He's a goner. Will it come soon? James, Jill admonished him, and his cavalier treatment of the unfortunate Ted Broughton's impending demise. There is a dark shadow over the year for this man, Broughton, Fred intoned gravely. Jim looked a little startled, as though awed in spite of himself. Jill looked at Fred, wide-eyed. Poor man, she said. 
Yes, said Jim soberly now. He's not looked himself for a while now. Is there more? Jill inquired urgently. There is. There are things hidden from view still. They may become clear. I can't see. There are mists obscuring. Yes, I see wealth, respect, advancement. A house, a large white stuccoed house with pilasters. It's more like a mansion. Wow, said Jim. This is spooky. I prefer Tudor-style, timber-framed houses, a bit out of kilter. Crooked, said Jill, her eyes glazed over a little with mild disappointment. It does have some black and white timbers, now that I see it more clearly, said Fred Kimp. Yes, the things I took for Grecian pilasters at first are old oak timbers. I see now it is a black and white Tudor mansion. I don't like mansions. They are too big and need too much cleaning and looking after, Jill commented. It's more like a cottage, said Fred, still peering into the glass for instruction. I don't want something small and pokey either, said Jill. A very large cottage, said Fred, having to work for his money. Has it got a large garden too, she inquired. Yes, said the seer, a large garden with a pond in it. They're dangerous for children, Jill said, a worried, uncertain look on her face. It has completely dried up years ago, said Fred quickly. Is there a woman there? inquired Jill urgently. I see a woman, yes. She is filled with uncertainty. Doubt besets her. Yes, said Jill encouragingly. The woman is fair, beautiful. Her eyes, they shine like sapphires resplendent in the moonlight. She touches the stars. Their light is in her eyes. She is surrounded by the spirits of the past. They watch and protect her. She and the man are happy. There is more. I see a child, a beautiful golden-haired boy. I wanted a girl, she said in an aside to Jim. And a girl with darker hair, continued the adaptable Fred. I wish she was fair too, she said to Jim in a whisper. The girl's hair turns to gold in the sunlight, continued the inventive Fred. They are happy. I see much laughter in their lives, and their path is filled with sunshine. Inspirational, my friend, said Jim, when he met his friend later that evening. Inspirational. She bought into it completely. You had me going for a little while. Well, I didn't like doing it, to be honest, said Fred, but Jill's shining eyes were an inspiration, I must admit. They really do sparkle. Yes, yes, it was a great show, a great show we put on, said Jim, clapping Fred on the back. Fred looked at him. All right, he said, I'll give you that. It was a job well done. That it was. So, uh, about that two hundred pounds, said Fred eagerly. Was it that much, really? Oh, yes, said Fred firmly. Well, I'll give you a hundred pounds now and give you the other hundred pounds next time I see you. Jim saw Jill the next day. Well, what did I tell you? She demanded, basking in the golden light of her success. Jim looked rueful, apologetic even, not characteristic she easily associated with him. I have to say, he said with reluctance, he called it the way it is. I told you, she exclaimed, he has the gift. I can tell these things. I have to admit it. He does, agreed Fred. He's a prodigy. I was mistaken. He darted a little sideways glance at her to check that there were no signs of doubt. There were none. Her eyes were lit like the sapphires or whatever it was Fred had seen in them. Sparkling. He's a genius, she said. He has the aura. He knows his onions, said Jim, matter of fact. Fancy him seeing all those marvellous things about us, she said excitedly. Yep, it's a good future we've got going for us. Did you see the little boy and girl? I did, said Jim. I have been seeing them ever since, 
she told him, gripping his arm. Yes? How well his plan had worked. If only she knew it. He was the one who was the genius. He was the seer of all things in their future. Jill was staring off into the distance, still in the thrall of those two little golden-haired children, conjured for her so obligingly by Fred Gimp. Then, after a few moments, she broke free from her trance and looked directly at Jim. We must see him again, she said decidedly. Jim looked at her. What? he said. We must see him again. He can tell us more. What more do we want to know? inquired Jim cautiously. Oh, all kinds of things, she said. This is too good an opportunity to miss. We already know what we need to know, he protested. The rest we will find out in the course of time. I want to know more, just a little more. Then we can leave it, said Jill. You take it from me. It's best we don't know any more. Oh, really, she returned. If it was left to you, we wouldn't even have got that wonderful reading Fred gave us in the first place. We can't just leave it here. I believe he's returning to Australia soon, he countered. Well, then there's no time to lose, she urged him. You must get in touch with him quickly and arrange for another session. Jim looked unhappy. Oh, I don't know, he said. Why are you so reluctant? I can't believe you don't want to take this journey further, now that you have discovered it too. It's just that I don't like to disturb Fred. He's got lots of relations to see, and his brother's getting married. He's here such a short time. She considered this. Yes, she said. It doesn't seem fair, said Jim, pressing his advantage. Hmm... I see what you mean. Perhaps it's selfish of me, she said, and felt crestfallen. That's it, said Jim, brightening. We ought not to disturb him any more than we have. All right, said Jill, after a long pause. But, wait a minute, here's an idea. We could see someone else to take the story further. I know someone who can do it for us. Camille, I'll get in touch with her. What? No, said Jim curiously emphatic for a convert to things mystical. Why not? said Jill, surprised by his opposition to this. Why? said Jim, slowly. Why? I'll tell you why. Why is because it, it it's because it would be interrupting the vision or whatever it was Fred gave us. Oh, don't worry, she said, setting aside his rookie doubts with a dismissive laugh. This woman is really good. She'll give us a reading we can trust. Jim looked concerned at this and thoughtful. I'd prefer Fred, he said sullenly. So would I. But what can we do? Jim was thinking hard. I suppose I could ask him as a special favour to a pal to do one more reading for us, he mused. Oh, would you? said Jill, ecstatic at the proposal. I could try, said Jim, somewhat forlorn. If he can't, it doesn't matter, Jill reassured him. Camille will do it for us. Something tells me I may be able to persuade him, said Jim. It was not an easy sell to Fred. He was quite adamant. I told you I didn't like doing it the first time, he said. It was a one-shot deal. Yes, but you did such a great job. I need you to do me one more favour, the last I'll ever ask you to do for me, I promise. You don't deserve her, said Fred. She is an angel. Eyes like... Yes, yes, I know, like emeralds, Jim said. It was sapphires, Fred Gimp corrected him. Like sapphires. Hmm, said Fred, and at a judicious moment added... I'll bring you the other one hundred pounds I owe you when you come. Fred looked at Jim sharply. The second reading was not quite so satisfactory as the first one had been, as it turned out. Jim welcomed his friend and seer of things unseen enthusiastically. You are a marvel, he told him, when Fred sat down. Fred glowered at Jim somewhat resentfully. I may be, 
he said. You are, you are, my friend, Jim assured him. We'll see, said Fred, with a gleam in his eyes. They lit up even more when Jill entered the room, though. Well, let's get to it, said Jim. Fred's time is precious. Again Fred unfurled the crystal ball, which offered a lens upon the future, a window to their lives as yet unspun. The mists in the glass obscure so much, he said, studying the orb on the dining table before him. I must see beyond the veil, the clouds that hide from us the things that will be. Ah, I see a woman. She has eyes like precious blue stones. They glitter with the brilliance of sapphires, like a shallow sparkling sea in the brightest sun. That's me, said a joyous Jill, opening her eyes wide and blushing with delight. Hmm, said Jim, let's get on with it. There is a man, an ill-favoured sort of man, with small, peculiar eyes, beady and red-rimmed, probably from too much drink. An ugly scar mars his face. That's you, said Jill, excitedly to Jim, who was now regarding Fred rather sourly. I see a child, said the seer. Jill leaned forward excitedly. A small, hairy child in your future, said Fred. What? shouted Jim. Jill looked concerned. A small, hairy child, demanded Jim. It might be a chimpanzee, said Fred, uncertain. It isn't clear. Why would we have a chimpanzee? inquired Jill. Perhaps you can't have children and adopt a chimpanzee, hazarded Fred. What ridiculous garbage, shouted Jim. I can only tell you what I see in the glass, said Fred doggedly. Oh, yes, I bet you can't see who's going to win the 450 at Donington, can you? He sneered. Don't be silly, Jim, said Jill. Fred's doing his best, and we know he's got the gift. I hope you can see 100 pounds is hanging in the balance, Jim said threateningly, glaring at Fred. Wait a minute, I am seeing something new, said the seer. What is it? asked Jill. Oh, that is odd. A tall, handsome man, with dark hair and green eyes that remind me a little of the woman's, has appeared. He is with the woman. What happened to the red-eyed drunken man and the little hairy chimp? inquired Jill. They have moved beyond the scope of the glass for the moment, said Fred. Perhaps they have joined a zoo or some kind of show, suggested Jill, mystified. Oh, have they? demanded Jim, who was glaring at Fred, who steadfastly avoided his friend's eyes. They'd better be back soon. He can't do that, said Jill. Do you know nothing of people with psychic abilities? He can't just bring people back at will. I know he'd better get them back if he knows what's good for him, said Fred. Don't be childish, Jim, said Jill. Fred continued regardless. The woman with sapphire eyes and the man with green eyes are together. They have beautiful children with blue-green eyes. Quite extraordinary. Oh, I wonder who he could be, said Jill coquettishly. It isn't you, Jim. Yes, I wonder who it could be said an angry Jim. He is one who knows the spirits, said Fred, nodding sagely, and then turning to Jill, peering at her with his own eyes wide open, revealing them to be distinctly green in hue. Oh, I can vouch for that, said Jim. He knows all about spirits, and seldom buys a round of them himself, I can tell you. Fred ignored this slur. Wait, he said. The ill-favoured man has returned. He is wandering about somewhere with the chimpanzee. I think it's a chimpanzee. Perhaps it's his wife, suggested Jill, helpfully. Mind you, you've a lot of hirsute people on your mum's side of the family, Jim. Your Uncle Derek is practically a gorilla. It was too much for Jim. 
His impotence to command the situation or counter any aspect of it brought him almost to bursting point. Oh, I've had quite enough of all this rubbish, he said. I'm not listening to any more of it. He's only telling us what is in the glass, said Jill, reproving him. It's not his fault if it isn't what you want to hear. He can't just make it up, you know. Oh, can't he? demanded Jim, quite furious. You're being silly now, said Jill. Well, you can listen to this rubbish if you like, but I'm not going to. I'm going to the pub. Seems I have a hundred pounds to spend, he said with a nasty look at Fred. He left the room. Watch out for hirsute women whose knuckles drag along the floor, called out Jill. Moments later, they heard the door of the house slam. It just wouldn't work out between us, Jill told Jim later when she met him in the park. I should have seen it before. I'm sorry. No, that's no problem for me, said Jim with studied levity. No problem at all. I have loads of women queuing up for me. Don't you worry about me. That's good, said Jill. I'm happy for you, because I need to tell you something. I'm seeing someone else. Some friend in spookology, I suppose, he inquired sarcastically. Well, he's very spiritually minded, she countered, if that's what you mean. Jim stopped dead in his tracks. Oh, no he said with sudden, dawning realisation. Surely not that spineless, brainless gorm from... Yes, she said softly. Him. Freddy understands me completely. Oh, he does, does he? said Jim, brightening. Yes, he does. He's wonderful, she said. I see. I see. Jim laughed. He knows the spirits, eh? The future and all that. <laughs> well, then... I don't mind telling you, it was all a set-up from the start. We set you up and you totally fell for it. We made a complete fool out of you, which kind of proves my point, really, doesn't it? It's all bunkum. Total nonsense. Jim laughed, a bit too heartily. Jill was regarding him quietly. Oh, I know, she said softly. Jim's laughter declined to an uncertain sneer. He stared at her. What? he said. Jill sighed. It was obvious from the start, as soon as you and Fred entered the room and he began spouting a load of gibberish. You always overplay your hand, Jim. It's one of your problems. I met Fred after that first session in town and confronted him. I asked him what the hell he thought he was doing. Did he think I was some kind of idiot? He said he didn't think I was an idiot at all, and he apologised profusely and told me all about it. He told me he never wanted to do it, and that after he met me, he regretted it even more. Her eyes sparkled, and her voice was subdued in remembrance of their meeting. So we decided to have a little fun at your expense. I'm sorry, it wasn't very kind of us, but you did sort of ask for it, and you set yourself up beautifully. Oh, I did, said Jim, furious. Yes, you did, said Jill. Well, for your information, Fred Gimp doesn't believe in all this mumbo-jumbo stuff any more than I do. Yes, I know, she said, but he's far too nice to say so, or to mock me for my beliefs. It's one of the things I like about him. Jim glared at her. So it's like that then, is it? Yes, she said. Anyway, I'm returning to Australia with Freddy next week, so I don't expect we'll see each other again. Goodbye, Jim. She began to walk away. You deserve each other, Jim called out as he watched Jill's retreating figure in the park. She did not reply. Oh, and another thing he got wrong, he continued. Your eyes are nothing like sapphires, nothing at all. But it is doubtful whether Jill heard anything of this parting shot. Mm -hmm.